Diving Championship. This pool is one of the fastest in the United States and since 1982 has been the site of nearly every major competition in this sport. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Patrick and it's great to have you with us for the NCAA Swimming and Diving Championships being shown on ESPN for the very first time. And our analyst is a former Olympic champion and a nine-time NCAA titleist, Brian Goodell. And Brian, it looks like the team championship's up for grabs. It is, Mike. Stanford has to be the favorite coming into the meet, but they're going after their fourth consecutive team title, and they have to make up for points that they lost when Pablo Morales and Jeff Kostoff mm -hmm. graduated last year. Skip Kinney will be looking for younger, less experienced swimmers to pick up those points in the stroke events. They'll face some serious challenges from University of Southern California and from Texas. Mm -hmm. Southern Cal has older, more experienced swimmers, such as Mike O'Brien, the Olympic champion for the 1500 meters, and they're going to be looking for big swims out of their seniors and out of some of their, their real classy swimmers. Uh, the University of Texas, on the other hand, is going to rely on the depth that they have in their middle distance freestyle events and their middle distance stroke events. And it's going to be a real tight competition. Any other teams we should keep an eye on? I think so. I think Michigan from the Big Ten has really shown a lot. They won the Big Ten championships. They haven't been here in the top ten in a couple of decades, really. Mm -hmm. And also LSU won the Southeast Conference Championship. They have some very powerful sprinters. And they're going to have an impact on this competition. All right, Brian. We'll also be working with Phil Boggs, who is down at poolside and the former Olympic diving champion. Phil, what are your thoughts coming into this meet? Mike, more than in any other swimming competition, team motivation is a factor. The team spirit and enthusiasm has helped inspire some great performances over the year. Southern Cal hopes to boost its title hopes by rooting on and cheering for its freshman superstar, Dave Wharton. Dave is a former world record holder and is a favorite in both individual medley events. For Texas, they'll bring on Doug Jertson. He could win as many as three individual titles and possibly help their team to two more relay titles. Stanford will counter and add on American record holder Jay Mortensen, the favorite in the 100 backstroke, and the favorite also in the 100-yard butterfly. We should see some great individual performances and an outstanding team race. Phil will also be covering diving, of course. In addition to the one and three meter as usual, we have something new this year in the NCAA. Now, the NCAA has added platform, an exciting, dangerous event, also an Olympic event. Look for platform in colleges to be a great training ground for U.S. Olympians. But one of the favorites in this event is a Mexico Olympian, Jose Rocha, competing for Auburn. His competition should come from Patrick Jeffrey, a senior at Ohio State and a member of the U.S. national team, and also Scott Doney, a sophomore at Southern Methodist. All right, Phil, we'll be looking forward to it. And the NCAA Men's Swimming and Diving Championships are being brought to you by Sue B. Honey, purity you can taste and by Michelob. So exceptionally smooth, the night belongs to Michelob. We'll be back with a 400-yard individual medley in just a moment. What you are looking at is a tradition unique to the sport of swimming, and Brian, what are they up to? Well, that's Tennessee captain Mike Masters taking water from the Tennessee Swim Center and pouring it in the pool here to take away the home pool advantage. Tennessee instituted this tradition 21 years ago when Coach Ray Buzzard joined the school. And he is retiring after those 21 years. He won the NCAAs in 1978. And this is the first event that we'll take a look at, the 400-yard individual medley. There's the NCAA record set in 1985. Jeff Kostoff of Stanford. And this should be a very good field, led by David Wharton, the freshman from Southern Cal, one of the most sought-after prospects in years. Even as a freshman, he feels he has the experience to compete. I've had a lot of experience in my swimming career, and I really think that 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 is going to pay off, and um, I'm not going to feel as pressured as other freshmen would coming into such a big meet. This is Matt Rankin, who will start in lane five out of the University of Arizona. He was second in this event, sixth in the 200 individual last year, seventh in the 400 at the 1987 Long Course Nationals. And over in lane one, Jeff Pryor of California, former club teammate of Horton, he was second in the 400 IM last summer at the Pan Ams after finishing fourth in that event in the Long Course Nationals. 
this should be a pretty competitive field, maybe with the exception of Wharton, who's the favorite. Wharton swam a very strong race this morning. He looked very relaxed, and, and I would look for him to, to go faster than the 346 time he put in this morning. And that was only 15 one hundredths of a second off the American record. Interesting story about how Wharton came to Southern California because everybody wanted him. Yes, Wharton is a hearing impaired athlete, and he was impressed by the treatment that Jeff Flo, the, the great Olympic champion from USC, received while he was at Southern Cal. And, and I think that really intrigued him about the Trojan program. The swimmers must come down to a complete stop before the buzzer sends them off. They're off to a clean start. Lane one at the bottom of your screen, lane eight at the top, and you see Wharton in lane four with the early lead. Well, he took it out this morning nice and strong. You can see him. He looks real smooth there in the fly, and, and he this morning he looked very relaxed. He looks much the same tonight. Uh, you, you keep an eye on Ray Luz over there in lane number seven for Southern Cal. Right now, Jamie Taylor in six is swimming second. Right. Luz is going to be trying to pick up some points for the Trojans. We, we, we showed Jeff Pryor prior to the race. He was a, a high school teammate of Wharton's, and he's a strong finisher. We're looking for a 53-1-3 at this split to beat the American record pace by Jeff Costa. Wharton in lane four with the lead. Still second, Jamie Taylor of Florida in lane six. Good butterfly man and a backstroker, and they have shattered the 100-yard split. He's, he's two and a half seconds ahead of Kostov's American record pace, and he looks real smooth, real strong out there in front. The transitions in, in the 400 individual medley are strong, that are, are important. The, the transitions between the, the different strokes, from the butterfly to the backstroke, the backstroke to the breaststroke. Especially the, net, the one coming up after this turn will be the backstroke to the breaststroke. And the swimmer is beginning to, to feel quite a, quite, a, uh, quite a bit of exhaustion at this point. And he needs to go underwater here for about half the length in the breaststroke. Now, you won this event three times in the NCAAs. Is it more important to have one stroke where you can really dominate your competition? Or is it more important not to have a major weakness? Well, it's, you need to be strong in all four strokes. Wharton is strong in all the strokes. Now, so Wharton's split there was a 149. It's three seconds ahead of the American record split of Jeff Kostoff. Kostoff set the record in 1985. And at this pace, Wharton is also going to challenge the U.S. Open record, which is about three and a half seconds faster. The U.S. Open record is held by Thomas Darney of Hungary. The U.S. Open record means that that's the fastest time that's ever been done in the United States. And an interesting story is that Wharton broke the world record in the 400 meter individual medley last summer at the Pan Pacific Games, and Darney turned around and broke Wharton's record four days later. So I, I think that Wharton might be looking for a score to settle here. The split three-fourths of the way through would be 254.93, anything under that, and he's on his way to, a world, uh, to an American record. The, the U.S. Open record equates literally to a world record. Mm -hmm. the split, There's the split. 252-3-4, he's well ahead of it. He needs to come home in a 54-1 to break the American record. And he came home much faster than that this morning. He was home in a 51 plus. And here he just has an open water lead over the rest of the field. It's a one man race. Rankin is second, but well back. John Davey out of Iowa in lane two is third but it's Wharton against the clock right now. And he looks real strong. He's going for the record. You can see the kick, the intensity of his kick right now. He's sprinting for the wall. The crowd is cheering him on. There's a strong contingent from USC here. And it looks like he's got it. He'll certainly have the American record. The question is whether he gets the US Open record. He certainly got the first one in the Southern Cal cheering and, section loves it. And he's got it. Great performance for David Wharton, the freshman from Southern Cal.
wins the 400 IM in a record time. We're waiting for the official time. And that's a great event for Southern Cal. They need the points in this but team championship. He's really leading this team to a, to a great meet. There's his teammates con congratulating him behind the blocks there. Matt Rankin of Arizona was second in the race. Here's a replay of the final lap. Here you see Wharton. He looks very strong coming into the wall. He's very intent on getting that record. Wharton the winner out of Southern Cal. Here, here he's waiting for the time. And he sees the time. It's a new American U.S. Open record. Phil Boggs down at poolside, and he has a very happy David Wharton with him. Dave, congratulations. Did you hear the crowd coming home? Yes, I did, very much. It was a big help, too. Did you expect to get the record? Is that what your goal was for tonight? Definitely was. I knew I, was, I cruised this morning, and I worked some of the parts, but I knew I could go a lot faster. And I really wanted that record because I have an old score to settle. Is it settled now, or will we see it again this summer? Army. said, is it settled now, or are we going to see the race again this summer? We're going to see a definite race this summer. Congratulations. Great swim. Mike? Phil, thanks very much. And, of course, uh, David Wharton, along with many people here at the NCAA Finals, pointing toward the Olympic Games. Matt Rankin of Arizona finished second in this race. John Davey of Iowa finished third. We'll be back with more from the NCAAs in Indianapolis in a moment. This is the men's 100-yard butterfly, the record set by Pablo Morales of Stanford, 46-26, probably not in jeopardy in 1988 here in Indianapolis. The favorite, Dave Catamatori of USC, had the fastest time in the heats, fin final in three events at last year's NCAA meet. He was fifth in the 100. Anthony Moss of Stanford in lane five, a 6'1 senior from Auckland, New Zealand. He was sixth in the 100-meter fly and fifth in the 200-meter at the 84 Olympic Games. And also from Stanford in lane six, Jay Mortensen, 6'5", 186. He was second in this race a year ago, fourth in the 100-meter fly at the World University Games last summer. This is a pretty good field. This, this, this is a very strong field. You've got Mark Long of Iowa, uh, Mark Henderson of California, Keith Anderson of Texas. David Katamatori here of Southern Cal really swam a strong race this morning and provided a spark for his Southern Cal teammates. And he's looking to carry that in through the finals tonight. Do you think he surprised some people this morning? I think he did. I think uh, Anthony Moss and Jay Mortensen were the favorites from Stanford, and they're going to be after him tonight in the final. So it should be four, five, and six to keep an eye on. Don't forget Wade King in lane three. All right, this is an all-out 100-meter sprint from the gun. And that will be four lengths of this pool. Now, this being a 25-yard pool, the turns really become a factor. The turns are very important in these 100-meter races. You have a start and three turns. A lot of fast swimming in between. We have a false start. And the rule for false starts is one and you're gone. And you're gone. We didn't see who the official calls. Yeah. It's a rather severe penalty. Especially when you're looking at these points in this team standing exactly race. do you think that's fair to have one false start in your out? i mean there was so much controversy about the uh, olympic uh, false start rule which i think everybody agreed was a little bit ridiculous it's fair but it really does help keep the swimmers honest when they start uh, you're not going to get that much by by getting a rolling start even in a hundred butterfly and I think it really keeps them honest, gets a fair start for everybody. Now, there are the three officials. You need two of those officials to agree it was a false start in order for it to stand. Is that correct? That's correct. And if only one official says it's a false start, it's nothing. 
That's right. Then no one will be disqualified. And that's what it'll be. Nothing. The, the, the officials could not agree on who moved early. And I think you may find some of that in a lot of meets where one false start and you're out, the penalty is so severe, you may have trouble getting two of the three judges to say, indeed, it was a false start. That's true. And I don't think they're necessarily going to not agree just to keep someone in there. I think they're, they're truly going to speak their mind. And, and uh, if someone moved, he's going to be disqualified. The starter is Russ White from Houston. Still the second time, doesn't it? Very still. Ganimatory, the favorite in lane four, but right now six men came to the wall together. Looks like Jay Mortensen had the lead going into that first turn. Mortensen in lane six. I still have to say Mortensen so has close. the lead. So close. Actually, Bailey touched first from USC. Mortensen was second. Bailey is in lane two. And as you can see, they're well behind the NCAA record. And it's Mortensen in lane six. Mortensen has a commanding lead going into the wall. Looks like it may be a one-two Stanford finish. Mortensen gets there. Mortensen was first, and Wade King of South Carolina was second. Anthony, Anthony Moss of Stanford will get third, so Stanford gets first and third out of this event. That's a very strong finish for them, much better than this morning's heat. Here's the stretch to the wall. You can see Mortensen just churning into the wall there. He's got a commanding lead, and you see Wade King just reach in and out touch uh, Anthony Moss for second place. Mortensen wins it in 47-27, and Phil Boggs down at poolside has the winner with him. Phil. Jay, congratulations. Did you see him all coming into the wall? No way. I don't really look around. I uh, just put my head down and I really go for the wall. That, did the false start impact the race at all, or your race at all? I don't think so. You know, we prepare for that sort of thing. It happens somewhat frequently during the year. You just have to, you know, put it behind you, climb out on the ladder, get ready back on the block and go. You got the 100 back throw coming out, coming up. What about that? Well, I got to warm down real quick here, but uh, I'm excited about it. I'm swimming well. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Jay Mortensen, the winner in 47-27. Wade King of South Carolina in second in 47-51. Nine one hundredths of a second ahead of Anthony Moss of Stanford, who takes third place. Let's take you back a little bit earlier to the 500-yard freestyle and show you the end of that event. And you'll see Stanford's John Witchell finishing up in lane five. He has already overtaken Jason Gorey of Florida, who had the early lead as we come to the finish, Brian. He's also ahead of Dan Jorgensen of Southern Cal, and he's powering in here to the wall. He really provided a spark for Stanford in this event, but Southern Cal scored four finalists in this event, winning 53 and a half points. May have been a little bit of a disappointment for Southern Cal, even though they did have that many people in there because Jorgensen, the defending champion, and he ties for second at 417 and 16 one hundredths of a second. But uh, big, big event for Witchell. It was a very big event for Stanford and for Southern Cal. Of course, we'll have John Witchell coming up in the 200 freestyle in just a few minutes. We'll see if he can win another one. Set to go in the 200-yard freestyle. There's the NCAA record, 133.03, set last year by California's Matt Biondi. Favorite in this one, Doug Jertson of Texas, sophomore. The 1987 meet, he was ninth in this event. That's because he did not swim very well in qualifying at all, did not even qualify for the finals. May have learned a lesson this year because he qualifies first this time around. Also in the field, John Witchell of Stanford, who won the uh, 500. And this is Craig Oppel of UCLA, the junior from Des Moines, Iowa. Third in this race, fifth in the 100 free, and fourth in the 500 free last year. 
He's in lane five, will certainly be a threat. And John Witchell also in this field after winning the 500. You just saw him. He won the 200-meter free at the Goodwill Games in 86, won the 200-yard free or the 200-meter free last year here in this pool at the Pan Am Games. So once again, a pretty good, a pretty good field. Uh, how do you feel about double wins? Well, I think uh, Doug Jertson and Craig Oppel will have a heck of a race here. Also, John Witchell, who did win the 500 free, had a very nice swim this morning. He also had a very good split on Stanford's pre uh, prelim relay. You also have to, you can't count out uh, Michael Bryan of Southern Cal over there in lane seven. He's an Olympic champion. He's a senior, and Southern Cal's having a very good meet. O'Brien is in lane seven. Doug Jertson went out very fast this morning. He, last year, he went out a little easy in the prelims, and he didn't make the final. He just got into the consolation final, and he wanted to make sure that he that didn't happen to him again this year. You'll see him go out very fast. Craig Oppel, on the other hand, will go out a little bit behind him. He's a racer, and he'll try and run Jertson down in the last 50 meters. Jertson now has the lead after Brent Lang of Michigan took the early lead and gave it up. And the race belongs in the middle of the pool, lanes three, four, five. Not a bad performance by John Davis over in lane eight out of North Carolina. He's a freshman. He's actually challenging for second place right now, but it is Jertson from Texas. It's on this third 50-yard lap uh, stretch that you want to look for the leaders to emerge from the field. And Doug Jertson and Craig Oppel are doing just that. 46-53 was the split, and that's well off the American record. Jertson still holding his lead over Oppel, but they're both commanding the race. John Davis over in lane eight, challenging. John Witchell also looking very strong in lane three, the 500 champion. Jertson's got the lead in and out of the last turn, and it's just a race for the wall at this point. Oppel trying to challenge him, but it's going to be Jertson. Jertson for Texas. Oppel out of UCLA will finish second in lane five. And the winning time, 134.51, about a second and a half off the American record. Set by Matt Biondi. That was a little bit slower than preliminary time this morning. Here we look at his last turn going into the last lap. You can see Jertson really driving into the wall. He pushes off. He can see Oppel as he pushes off. Oppel's going to try and make a run for him, but he just doesn't have enough. Here's Jertson. He's got about 12 yards to go into the wall. Now this, is from, this is from a young man who didn't qualify for the finals last year because he made a mistake in the heats. Job, Adam. Did not make that same mistake this year. Uh, let's get down to Phil Boggs. He has a happy winner with him. <laughs> Doug, congratulations. You had the early lead. Did you see him chasing you? Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. The only way I could, the only way I could win was to get out in front of how much impact does the team cheering you on help in these races? Tremendously. You can't believe how much it helps. Great team support. Looking forward to a great meet. Congratulations. Mike? All right. Thank you very much, Phil. And Jertson, the winner, out of Texas. Craig Oppel from UCLA takes second. And Brent Lang, who led early, then dropped back, came back to take third out of the University of Michigan. Let's take you back a little bit right now to the 400 medley relay. An American record holder, Jay Mortensen, got standard, Stanford rather off to an early lead. Mortensen was about a second off his American record split on this relay. Stanford's lead quickly overcome by Texas in the breaststroke. There's Kurt Stackle, a sophomore for Texas. 
Texas quickened the pace when they went to the butterfly, and then Chris Jacobs preserves the win in the freestyle. Jacobs just able to hold on for a win over UCLA. And Texas takes the 400-yard medley relay, and those relays are so important in the team standings. And there is the result of the medley relay. Texas in 313 and 97. UCLA finished second. Defending champion Stanford finishes third. And we'll be back with more from the championships in a moment. We're ready for the 100-yard breaststroke here in Indianapolis. Steve Lundquist of SMU set the NCAA record back in 1983 of 52-48. And the favorite after today's heats, Giovanni Menervini of UCLA. He is a senior, was the silver medalist in the 100-meter breast at the 86 World Championship, second in this race last year at the NCAAs. And despite a collapsed lung, was the 1986 NCAA champ. Last year was when he had the collapsed lung and finished second. In lane two, Todd Torres won this event last year, knocking off Minervini. Out of LSU. And in lane six, Mark Miller from Wyoming. He's a senior, was seventh in the 200-meter breast last year and the first Wyoming swimmer ever to reach the finals of the NCAA. Running out the field in lane three, you have Hans Dersch from University of Texas sporting an interesting haircut. So this is a quick race. It's a power event. The, the swimmers never have a chance for their arms and legs to rest. They're always in motion. false start on that now you mentioned haircuts uh, there are several interesting haircuts on these guys what did what did you do when you swam in this event i mean did you shave I, all I did, the hair off your body you could per personally i just uh i got a nice short clean haircut and, and knew i was ready to go <laughs> and I, I did shave down my arms and legs but again looking at our lane assignments we have uh, john eric olson from michigan in lane one todd torres from louisiana state Lane two, Hans Dersch from Texas in lane three, Giovanni Minervini from UCLA in lane four, Kirk Stackel from Texas, Mark Miller from Wyoming in six, Peter Bowden in seven, and Dan Eglin in, from Minnesota in eight. Two former NCAA champions, Minervini in four, Torres in two. Torres and, and Olsen just illustrate the point I was making about LSU and Michigan. Making it in here, making an impact on this meet. But Minervini is the favorite tonight, and he hits the wall first at 25. Four lengths of the pool. Minervini in four. And it looks like Mark Miller in six. And gaining a little bit of ground, Kurt Stackel from Texas in five. Minervini went out hard this morning, and he's doing the same tonight. Look this split is uh, 39 one hundredths of a second off the NCAA record. Kirk Stackel really gaining some room on, on Minervini. It looks like Minervini's going to hold off for the finish. Minervini will take it to battle for second, and it looked like Kirk Stackel of Texas in lane five got in there for it. And he did. Miller from Wyoming will finish third. Miller in lane six, so Minervini follows up a fine performance in the heats earlier with a victory here. Let's take a look at Giovanni Minervini's stroke. He's a very powerful swimmer. You see him coming up out of, high, out of the water high and really diving forward over his hands to get some power as he pulls that water back. He has very strong legs, which allows him to do that. Good event for Texas. They play swimmers second and fourth in this event. Minervini out of UCLA, 6'4", 175 from Rome, Italy. And he is down at poolside right now with our Phil Boggs. Congratulations. Great race. Did you watch anybody else at all in the race? 
No, really, just in the turns a little bit. Because you had a lead from the beginning. Is, uh, was that your strategy? Uh, that's the way I swim it, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's not like... There is no strategy, I don't think. I was just <laughs> trying to go out strong and thought I could do a little better, but I'm happy. How about looking forward to this summer? Yeah, that's what I think. I mean, I changed my stroke this year a little bit. I know. I guess I'm, I my turnover is not as fast, so I hope that'll help me in golf course. And, you know, hopefully I'll make the team first, and then, then we'll go from there. Well, congratulations on this one. Good luck this summer. Mike? Thanks, Thanks Phil. Giovanni Minervini, the winner of UCLA, 53.90. 52.48 was the American record. Kurt Stackel of Texas finishes second. Mark Miller of Wyoming, third. Earlier in this meet, the 200-meter individual medley, and it was a show by USC's David Horton. David was very strong. He took a commanding lead in the race. Here we see him dominating the breaststroke. This is a, a, a pretty much an all-out sprint in this event. And he took the lead from the start and never relinquished it. Is it more important in this event to be strong in a couple or not weak in any? It's more important to be not weak in any event but the breaststroke does seem to have a, a strong impact on how a swimmer can do in this event. And here you see David Wharton really dominating the breaststroke into the freestyle. That gives him a nice lead. There's not a lot of room for anyone to catch him in that last 50 meters. That's what I was just going to ask you. Once you've got a body length lead at this caliber, it doesn't look like you're going to get beaten 50 meters. That's right, as long as you get through the breaststroke. David Wharton, and this is the second fastest time ever in this event. 145.04, just a tremendous performance by Horton earlier in this meet, winning the 200 IM, wins it 145.04. Doug Jerkson of Texas is second. Ron Carnaugh of California finishes third in the 200 IM. And we'll be back with a 100-yard backstroke right after this. This is the 100-yard backstroke, the NCAA record, set by Jay Mortensen of Stanford in 1987, 47-94. And Mortensen is also in this race, but the fastest qualifier was Sean Murphy, a Stanford teammate, a senior. He's in lane four, won the 200 back in 1985 in the 86 NCAA meets, ranked number three all-time for Stanford in this event. Then you've got Jay Mortensen, the record holder, doubled in the 100-yard butterfly tonight. He holds the American record in this event, but was second in the meet a year ago because he set the American record in the opening leg of the Stanford medley relay last year in Texas. And there is Andy Gill, the junior from the University of Texas, won the gold medal in the 100 meters back here in the Pan Ams. He was fifth and sixth in the 100 and 200 meter back, respectively, at the Long Course Nationals. Well, you really have to wonder if Jay Mortensen is going to be able to come back after that 100 meter butterfly uh, race and, um, and win this race. Sean Murphy had a great swim this morning. Andy Gill had a great swim this morning. And Stanford really needs some team points now. They were absent in the breaststroke events earlier. And they're looking for some big points out of Sean Murphy and Jay Mortensen. Here's our other swimmers. We have Paul Kingsman from California, Lawrence Trammell from Kansas, Scott Johnson in lane seven for Arizona, Eric Hansen, lane six for Iowa State, and Glenn Hawk from Virginia. Some of these swimmers will be, be doing a stand-up start, and others will be starting from in the water. It's, it's really their preference. The swimmers who are standing feel that it is easier to come down for the start rather than pull themselves, pull their weight up out of the water for the start. A little bit less exertion. Yes. Murphy in four, Mortensen in five. And watch how long they stay underwater. Some guys go almost the entire length of the pool. Well, there you can see Murphy doing just that. He just took one quick stroke and then hit his turn. Is that good or bad, do you think? Well, it can be good or bad. It's very fast. It's a very effective way to get through the water, but it uses a lot of oxygen in the legs. Eric Hansen of Iowa State, a 6'6 senior, has taken the lead. Here comes Murphy in four, though. 
And in lane five, Mortensen from Stanford. Five-way race. You see Mortensen's taking the lead. He came out of that turn first, and it looks like he's got the lead going into the wall. The American record holder does have the lead. Mortensen in lane five, and he'll win it. It's a one-two finish for Stanford. Jay it's Mortensen. a big race for the Cardinal. Yes, it's a very big race. Jay Mortensen and Sean Murphy. It's going one-two for Stanford. 48-17, which is only 23 one-hundredths of a second off of his American record. And teammates, Sean Murphy and Jay Mortensen, congratulating each other in the middle of the Indiana Auditorium here in Indianapolis. Andy Gill came in third for Texas. We'll be updating you uh, as we go along, of course, on the team standings. Here's the drive for the finish. You see Jay Mortensen and Sean Murphy finishing 1-2. And Andy Gill, just out of your picture there to the bottom, finishing third. There are the results. Jay Mortensen from Stanford in 48-17. His teammate, Sean Murphy, picks up the points for second place. And Andy Gill of Texas finishes third. To take you back a little bit earlier, we'll show you the 53 highlights. And this has got to be one of the most wide open races in the entire meet because so much of the power in the 53 graduated. It sure did. Matt Biondi is gone. And this, this race is wide open. You've got two very fast sprinters from Louisiana State. You have Brent Lang from Michigan, Keith Anderson from Texas. It's just a, a start, a turn, and a finish. Mark Andrews of LSU in lane four was the top qualifier. And boy, this one does get over in a hurry. Mark Andrews is a Canadian citizen who will be trying out for their Olympic team. And Mark Andrews of Louisiana State wins it. Race that was oh so close. Mark Andrews of LSU wins the 50-yard freestyle. Final results, Andrews of LSU, Adam Schmidt of LSU, and Brent Lang came back after a good start and a slow middle to place third from the University of Michigan. So after the 50-yard freestyle, after 10 events, Texas with 229 points and the lead over Southern Cal, defending champion Stanford, third with 163 and a half points. We'll be back with the one and three meter competition in a moment. Earlier, we had the one meter diving competition and it was defending champion Jose Rocha of Auburn in first place through nine rounds. He'd been Mr. Consistent all day. Last two dives we're gonna see are two of the most difficult dives done in competition. Roaches with a reverse one and a half somersaults with two and a half twists. Same dive we'll see from Patrick Jeffrey for his last dive. Jeffrey from Ohio State trying to come from fourth place and challenge for the lead. He needed a great dive here and he did one. Front one and a half with three twists, straight in, no splash, moved him up to second. One dive to go in the 11 rounds, and then Rocha does a dive with a low degree of difficulty. He decided to do a safe dive for last, an easy dive, 2.4 degree of difficulty. A little bit of the strategy. He saved an easy one for last. Jeffrey saved a hard one, but Jeffrey still needed a great dive. And the judges had not been particularly generous in their scores up to this point. We hadn't seen anything higher than an eight, and Jeffrey needed all eights to win it. he got with a great last dive. Patrick Jeffrey of Ohio State coming from fourth place in the last two dives, pleading as he looks at the scoreboard and then he sees it and he knows he's got it. He knew what he needed. And that's why he was watching the scores. It's a great feeling to be able to come through in the clutch like that to save two tough dives to the end and hit both of them just the way you want to. And the final results, Jeffrey with 541.15 points. He only wins by five points over Jose Rocha of Auburn. Lawrence Roderick of Nebraska finishes third in an extremely close competition.
ready for the three-meter diving competition from the Indiana University Notatorium. Phil Boggs with us, and Phil, it is a competition between Jeffrey and Rocha, the two men who went down to the wire in the one-meter. This is like a replay with a flip side. Rocha led all the way through the one-meter competition, very consistent. Jeffrey did a great last two dives to catch him and actually overtake him. This competition, it's Jeffrey who's got the lead and Rocha chasing. You're looking at Scott Doney from SMU. He comes in to the final dive in sixth place. This is an inward two and a half somersault till somersault towards the diving board, two and a half times. Excellent last dive. A little strategy here throughout the competition. They do 11 dives. We've seen 10. Last round of the most difficult somersaulting and twisting dives. And he's chosen for his last and inward. Some of the other divers have done this dive earlier in the competition. Two and a half somersaults. Watch the great entry. Straight in. Got seven and a halfs and two eights from the judges and picked up 67 points. Remember in diving, anything better than a seven is a good dive. So getting seven and a halves and eights, that was an excellent dive. Here is the leader, Patrick Jeffrey from Ohio State, 22 years old. He was the one meter diving champion, did a great dive on his last attempt to take it. Now what he's trying to do is preserve a 25 point lead. And he's doing the same direction of dive that he did on one meter. One meter it was a reverse one and a half somersaults with two and a half twists. This is with three and a half twists. Most difficult twisting dive done in competition. be your winner. <laughs> the door is not totally closed, but that was a great dive. Just a slight over-rotation. Watch as he takes off the diving board. He'll start somersaulting back towards us. Turn and do three and one-half twists. And a slight over-rotation on the bottom. Judges take off a little bit for that between six and a half and seven and a half on his score. Now, what are the judges, and you can see he doesn't look terribly happy with it, what are the judges going to be looking for in the rest of this round, and especially from Rocha when he comes up to try to challenge for number one? Well, interesting point about this is we watch Roddick do his last time the same dive, is Rocha is also doing the same dive. So now the judges are doing two things. They're going to look at what they're supposed to do for judging. That's the approach. That's walking on a diving board. The takeoff, how high do they get? The dive in the air, do they do exactly what they're supposed to be doing? And here you'll see whether Roddick does exactly what he's supposed to do, which is the one and a half somersaults. Great jump. A one and a half somersaults, three and one half twists. And the last thing they look at is the entry. And you can see his legs twist a little bit. A lot of splash on the entry. They take off a lot for that. So here's the competition coming up. Now they're going to compare Roaches to Jeffries. Roddick finished third in the one meter, but looks like he'll place eighth here. This is Rocha. He should be on the Mexican Olympic team, and this is his last chance. Now he needs nine and a halves and tens to win. It's and possible. We haven't seen anything approaching that from the judges. Not yet. Excellent last time. Not enough. No nine and a half. Not nine and a halves and tens. That's the one contest where you want to have Luginas on your team on the board next. <laughs> Six and a half to eight, the range of the scores, and that will not be nearly enough. Yeah, a little knee bend on the start of that. Straight up and down on the entry. It was good, just not really near high enough. And Rocha had a 20-point lead to hold second place coming in against Eric Murph, who is up next. Murph was 14th on the one-meter. Last year, he was fourth on the th in the three-meter competition. And he's got a shot at third again. Outside shot at second. He'd need virtually a perfect dive to do it. This is a forward three-and-a-half somersaults in a pike position. He's going to somersault forward but bend only at the waist. A little over rotation. And we talk about a three meter diving board and you see three and a half somersaults, you see one and a half with three and a half twists. They're only, that's the swimming, you know, your old basic swimming pool high board. They're only 10 feet off the water when they start. It's like going on trying it off your garage. <laughs> a little bit of spring on the end of your garage <laughs> yeah. would about be right. 
Good dive for Murphy. Finishes with 582 points. Should be enough to hold third for him. Next up, Mark Lindsay of Indiana. Same dive as uh, Rocha and Jeffrey. And this kid is Mr. Speed. One meter and three meter. He doesn't necessarily jump as high, and he certainly doesn't get as good at entries. But he twists and somersaults as fast as anyone in the world. Even in not that high. Oh, yeah, not that high, but just lightning fast. Looks like he's got plenty of time once he comes out of all the maneuvers. Absolutely. Just doesn't have the, uh, the stretch. Maybe quite the strength. Of some of the others. That may move Lindsay into fourth place in this competition. Now, of course, when you talk about diving these days, you have to mention Greg Luganus. Where would these folks fall in competition with Luganus and keeping in mind the Olympics coming up? Much Crawley doing excellent front one and a half with three twists. Anytime you mention Luganus, the word that follows immediately is favorite in any contest. These guys are excellent divers. Many of them have competed internationally. Patrick Jeffrey has been on the U.S. national team and has pushed Luganus in many contests. Rocha has been on the Mexican Olympic team and has also pushed Luganus. But anytime you say major championship like Worlds or Olympics in Luganus, it's favorite. This is the uh, final dive of the competition. Tomas Rosa out of Warsaw, Poland, going to school at Iowa. And likely to be another Olympian. Mm -hmm. And a good last dive, but he's way down in the standings. Of course, you talk about Luganus, you talk about people pushing him, but not very often about beating him. That's mostly true, because all they've managed to do is push him, push him to greater performances. But he's going to have some good competition. Here you see for his final dive, it's two and a half somersaults forward, one twist, Rosa, from Iowa and Poland. Patrick Jeffrey of Ohio State wins the three-meter competition after taking the one-meter competition, and he wins it by 23 points over Rocha. And you can look to the platform competition, and Jeffrey's going to be one of the favorites there. Now, at not, not being a diver, I look at Jeffrey winning the one-meter competition and sort of assume he is going to be the favorite in the three-meter competition, but that's not necessarily so. Uh, in the United States, the divers train one meter, three meter, and often platform. Same thing. Internationally, you'll see divers enter only springboard or only platform. So it doesn't necessarily follow. The final results in the three meter competition. Jeffrey from Ohio State. The winner, Jose Rocha from Auburn, finishes second. And Eric Murph from Southern Methodist takes third. We'll be back with more from the NCAA Swimming and Diving Championships in just a moment. Teams stand after 11 events in the battle for the championship. Defending champion Stanford, third, and they're well back with 166 and a half points. And Texas, a team that finished in the top three for seven consecutive years until last year, 233 points with a 19 and a half point lead on Southern Cal. That's a pretty good lead. It, it is, but these have been Texas' best events up till now. They have uh, a number of events to go, and, and a 19-and-a-half point lead is not that much of an insurmountable lead for Southern Cal. This is the 800-yard freestyle relay, the record 621-29, set in 1984 by Florida. This is the Texas team with Jeff Olson up first that had the best time in the heat, 627-95, well off the American record. And their principal challengers expected to be in lane five, Southern Cal, and David Wharton is leading it off with Olympian Mike O'Brien swimming the anchor. Also keep an eye on Stanford there in lane four. Jeff Olson scored for Texas in the consolation heat of the 200 freestyle. Look for a good leadoff leg from him. David Wharton there in lane number five is your champion in the 200 and 400 individual medley events. He's also a very strong freestyler. Wharton has the lead right now with Texas running second in lane four. Wharton in five, swimming for Southern Cal. Wharton's are the top two teams overall. Yes, Wharton's a very smooth swimmer. He, he really glides up nicely on top of the water. 
Lane four nearest the camera, then lane five to the top of your screen. And in lane four, Jeff Olson of Texas, David Wharton of USC in lane five, and Olson has regained the lead. Also swimming very well, lane two, Florida, Jason Gore in lane one, Tony Monasterio of North Carolina. Jason Gorey was third in the 500 free, so he's also a very good middle distance freestyler. And you can look for a good strong leg out of Florida on his first, le first leg here. Stanford is trailing the field in lane three. Lanes five, four and five, Texas in four, USC in five. Texas with the lead over Southern Cal. Texas and SC are taking command of this race. Uh, Jeff Olson leading it. Here comes David Wharton, though, for a strong finish in the last lap of his leg. He'll and be Wharton is going to give Southern Cal the lead. He hands off the lead to Dave Canamatori. Dave was third in the 100 butterfly, and he's uh, also an excellent freestyler. Wharton split on the, the uh, first leg of that race was a 136.73, which is an excellent freestyle time for the Iamla. It's Southern Cal in lane five with the lead. Texas with Adam Worth making the comeback. This is lane five. Dave Catamatori had an excellent turn, gaining a little bit more on Adam Worth. Adam Worth was a finalist for Texas in the 200-yard freestyle. Catamatori in five, Worth of Texas in four. And North Carolina in lane one, now running third with John Davis. Catamatori still has the lead, but I think Adam Worth is starting to catch him a little bit. Lane four nearest the camp. Catamatori still behind a little bit. They're going into their last two laps of the second leg of this relay. They'll be handing off. Uh, Adam Worth will be handing off to Sean Jordan and uh, Dave Catamatori to Dan Jorgensen. They're both excellent middle distance freestylers. Dan Jorgensen was in the constellation here, the 200 freestyle, and was um, also a finalist in the 500-yard freestyle. You see Sean Do Jordan taking a little bit of a lead out there for Texas. For Jorgensen. Jordan got a great start. These two teams, 19 and a half points apart as we come into this event. The relays are very important in this meet because they score double, double points per relay. The winner of this relay will get 40 points. Splits on, on, on those two legs for uh, Katamatori at USC was a 136.02 for Adam Worth at Texas, a 135.43, giving that lead to Sean Jordan. Jordan holding the lead, but Jorgensen not letting him build on it at all. North Carolina still doing well in lane one, over in lane seven, UCLA gaining some ground. Yeah, that's Craig Oppel for UCLA over there. He was second in tonight's final of the, of the 200 yard freestyle. He's a very strong finisher of his leg. Jordan for Texas in four. Jorgensen from USC. And Jorgensen really closing the gap. And UCLA making it a real race over in lane seven. A great leg for Oppel. Oppel is a real team swimmer. And he does, he really performs well. Guys, it goes all out. He'll be handing off to Rob Grainer in lane seven for UCLA. Dan Jorgensen now takes the lead for USC, and he'll be handing off to Olympian Mike O'Brien. Jorgensen and USC in lane five, and it's USC, Texas, and UCLA. Sean Jordan hand off to Doug Jertson, who was the champion in the 200-yard event. And we look for a fine finish from him. O'Brien in lane five, Jertson in four. And that's Rob Grainer over in lane seven. The splits for the third leg. For Jorgensen, a 136.42, and for Sean Jordan from Texas, a 137.06. O'Brien holding the lead, but Jordan is gaining ground on him. These men, this, is, this will be their fourth 200-yard swim of the day. O'Brien.
continues to hold off Jertson. O'Brien for Southern Cal in lane five. Jertson in four. This is one of the great ones. When you get the two top teams racing each other head to head. Exactly. This is the, the final leg. There's a lot of pride. There's a lot of team spirit here. You see, see Mike O'Brien opening up a lead there. He's got two laps to go. 50 yards, O'Brien with a slight lead on Jertson. Southern Cal over Texas. This, this is the biggest race of this meet. This, is, this, is, this turn is the critical one right here. O'Brien in five, Jertson in Texas Jertson in four. Is, is Jertson's taking the lead into the wall. O'Brien is fading and Jertson wins it for Texas. Jertson just exploded in the last 20 meters. And it showed a lot of pride. And there is a very happy Texas team capturing 40 points to spread the distance ahead of Southern Cal. And O'Brien was yes. exhausted. He gave it everything he had and just couldn't quite hold that lead. Huge win for Texas. A team that went in with a 19 and a half point lead over Southern Cal, and now they build on that mark. Jerkson split on that, that 200 for the, for the last leg. It was a 133.6, and, and um, Mike O'Brien was a 134.7. That was the difference. Here's the final leg. As you see, Jerkson just powering past O'Brien. O'Brien starting to tighten up here. You can see the, the blood in the bat on his back. He, he's just getting into oxygen debt. Jerkson looks real strong. He's up high on the water. He puts his head down here, and he's just driving for the wall. Hits it perfect, and, and that's a great win for Texas. You can see the excitement and enthusiasm on his voice. He, in his mouth, he, he knew that he had O'Brien at that finish. That last 20 yards, it looked like he had at least 50% more strokes going in. And in the final results, Texas finishes first. A huge win for them. The Trojans are second. UCLA came from behind to take third place. And we'll be back with more from Indian right after this. After 12 events, Texas leads Southern Cal by 25 and one half points. Those are the two teams in contention for the title this year. And we are nearing the end of the 1,650-yard freestyle. That's right, 1,650 yards, and it's a grueling one. We're looking at the last lap here with Dan Jorgensen going by Jason Corey of the University of Florida. Just passed him with two laps to go for a great Southern Cal win. It's a 1,450.21. He, he trailed Corey through the whole race and came from behind with the last two laps to go. He tied Gorey going into the last two laps and out sprinted him to the wall. And I don't know how many people in here really thought he was going to be able to make that final sprint. He looked very tired. He looked very tired here. We're gonna take one more look at the finish here. So we see him not looking so tired here on the last lap as he sprints to the wall. You see Jason Gorey over in lane seven and Dan Jorgensen sprinting into the wall. The man in the middle of the pool, they're lapping. Jorgensen wins at a 1450.21. That's a good time for this meet. And this is a time trial, meaning what? This is a time, time final event, which means the swimmers only swim them once. They, they swim according to where they came into the meet, where they entered with their time. And that time, under 15 minutes, will give Dan Jorgensen of Southern Cal first place. And we'll be back with more in just a moment. Here's the way it stands right now after 13 events. Texas, 297 points, 16 and a half over Southern Cal. 16 and a half, not a huge lead, but right now Texas has got to feel pretty good about it. Texas is doing real well in this evening's events. But SC just had a big win in the 1653. This will be the 100-yard freestyle. You saw the record by Matt Biondi. This is Brent Lang, who had the fastest qualifying time, the sophomore from Michigan. He was third in the 50 free here and third in the 200 free. One of his principal contenders, Chris Jacobs, the senior from Texas, 10th in the 50 free, swam on the U.S. gold medal relay team last summer at the Pan Pacific meet in Australia. And Adam Schmidt of LSU, another senior, second in the 50 free, 
and eighth in this event at last year's NCAAs. From a team standpoint, there is no Southern Cal swimmer in the final. There are two Texas swimmers, though. Chris Jacobs in lane five and Sean Jordan in eight. Also, Joel Thomas of California in lane two. His primary sport is water polo. Brent Lang had the fastest time in the preliminaries this morning, and he also led off Michigan's prelim heat in the 400 relay with the second fastest time of the day. It's been a good meet for him and for Michigan. It sure has. Johnny Urbanchek, the coach of Michigan, picked Brent Lang as the captain of the 85 Sports Festival team because of his leadership ability. Lang with a slight lead. He's in lane four. In lane one, Mike Newhoffel of Arkansas. And there is Sam Fries, the LSU coach. His swimmer in their lane three, Adam Schmidt. He's one of the most animated coaches in college swimming. It's Brent Lang in the middle of the pool, and the favorite wins it in 2062. Well, the 2062 with oh, Brent was Brent Lang's 50 split. It was a 42.96. 4296 is just two hundredths of a second slower than his preliminary time this morning. Let's look at that finish one more time as Brent Lang sprints into the wall. He's a six foot six sophomore from University of Michigan. And we're really looking for great things from him over the years to come. Lang just ahead of Chris Jacobs of Texas and Peter Williams, the freshman from Nebraska, will get in there third. They were separated by less than one half second, so the final standings in the men's 100-yard freestyle. Brent Lang of Michigan, the winner in 42.96. Jacobs takes second. Williams is third. Back with. Back at the Division I Men's Swimming and Diving Championships from Indianapolis, and coming up to 200-yard backstroke, Rick Carey of Texas set the record to the NCAA mark in 1984. And in lane four, the favorite of this one, Doug Jertson of Texas. He's already won the 200 free, was second in the 200 individual medley. He's the defending champion in this event. Anchored the Texas 800 free relay to a win coming from behind to outtouch USC's Mike O'Brien, who is also in this field. In lane five, Sean Murphy of Stanford, second uh, two-time NCAA champion in this race, fourth in the race a year ago and there is Murphy in lane five Jertson in four and you'd have to think Brian if Jertson win this wins this race he could just about wrap it up for Texas Texas is looking very strong right now and, and I think they're beginning to feel like they've got it wrapped up this is the rest of the field and you see a Brian from USC over in lane seven they just need a tremendous performance from him for any chance that they have Yes, I do. Michael Bryan was the 1,500 meter Olympic champion in 1984. But don't be surprised with him here in the 200 meter back or 200 yard backstroke because last summer he won the gold medal in the Pan Am Games here in this very pool in the 200 meter backstroke. Also of interest is Sean Murphy of Stanford swimming there in lane five. Watch his turns. He does what they call a crossover turn. That is a very fast type of turn, but it is also very controversial. He can touch the wall once his hand, once his hand touches the wall, he can turn over and and uh, do a freestyle turn, which is a very fast turn. And this is Murphy, and he's ahead of the NCAA record on that 50-yard split. And that turn does give you more speed, but it looks like most people who are doing that really revolve past center before they touch the wall. It looks like they're all getting away with something there. Well, it's an illusion, a bit of an illusion. It's a tough one to call. Murphy in lane five has the lead. He is ahead of record pace in this event. He's really trying to get some distance between himself and Jertsen. Jertsen in four. Look at the split. Jertsen could be very tough on that back half of the race, the second hundred yards. Murphy with the lead in lane five. And Jensen in four. The split you're looking for, 117.45, would be record pace. Michael Bryan of Southern Cal right in there, head to head with Jertsen, losing a little bit on that turn. By four one hundredths of a second, he is ahead of the NCAA record. But here comes Jertsen. 
Murphy in five, Jerkson in four, the sprint to the finish. Can he catch him? It doesn't look like it unless Murphy just falls apart, and he looks like he's got it into the wall. Jerkson just doesn't have enough room to win for Sean Murphy and Stanford. Murphy hangs on to win over Doug Jerkson of Texas. And Stanford at least getting something out of this event. The three-time defending champions obviously not going to repeat again, but that's got to give them a big psychological lift. Well, that's a, that, that was a swim of pride for Stanford. We're going to take a look at Sean Murphy's turn here. This is the crossover turn. As he comes into the wall, he'll reach across his body. Once his hand hits the wall, he'll roll onto his stomach and do a somersault. It's a very fast turn. He comes off the wall and he does dolphin kicks to get under that wake of the other swimmers going into the wall. And now we watch Sean Murphy as he goes into the finish, driving for the wall. He looks like he's fading a little bit, but Jerkson doesn't have enough room to catch up. And you're talking about an event that is measured in hundreds of seconds and any edge you can get, you take it. And Sean Murphy, the winner from Stanford in the 200-yard backstroke. And Phil Boggs will be joining us later on during this event with interviews with some of the winners and covering the diving. And right now, Phil has the winner in this event. Sean, congratulations. A great race. You were way ahead of the field. Was that part of your strategy on it? Yeah, I just want to take it out. I had the speed in the 100 this year, and I thought by taking it out, I could control the race and make everyone else with my race. One thing that everybody noticed, you beat everybody on a turn. It's a little bit unusual turn. What about that? My legs are really strong. I was trying to do dolphin kick off, and I have a strong kick. I was trying to use that to my advantage. Doug, this morning, was really beating me on the turns coming off. So trying to use the momentum to get in and get out fast. The crossover turn helped you with that? I think crossover turn is very fast for that, yes. Congratulations. Great race. Mike. Sean Murphy of Stanford, the winner. Jerkson of Texas is second, and Paul Kingsman of the University of California finishes third. Back with more from Indianapolis in a moment. Pablo Morales of Stanford set the NCAA record in the 200-yard butterfly last year, and we're ready to see if anyone can beat his record off the trials. It looks pretty safe. There's the favorite, Anthony Moss of Stanford out of Auckland, New Zealand, third in the 100 fly. We asked his coach, Skip Kenny, on how important Moss has been to his club. Well, Anthony Moss is one of our real key. He's uh, experienced on an international level. This is uh, his fourth NC2As. Unfortunately, he swam behind Pablo for three years, but he's ready to, to break out of that. And uh, I look for him to, to be the favorite in the 200 fly. Stanford currently third, and there is Moss, as you heard, swam behind Pablo Morales for three years. His main challenger should be David Wharton, who will swim out of lane five from Southern Cal. The sensational freshman has the U.S. Open American and NCAA record in the 400 IM, won the 200 IM, also in this meet. Also in this race is Dave, Dave Catamatori of Southern Cal. He's a senior swimming in lane three. Southern Cal has two swimmers in this event. Texas has none, and Southern Cal's trying to catch up with Texas in the team standing. So this is a big event for Southern Cal. And boy, do they need every point they can get they, just to have a chance. They're running out of time. In lane seven, Sean Rowland of Utah is a senior. He was eighth in the 400 IM. And he's a, a real gentleman. He's a, he's a nice guy. Quiet for the start. The swimmers are coming down. Hold still for the start. At that point, apparently, the starter saw something he didn't like. He saw a little bit of movement there. Decided to call him back. Remember, a false start. One, and you're out. Sudden death. in lane four is the favorite, but Wharton in lane five has taken the lead at the start. Wharton's having a fantastic meet here. He's a freshman. He's been swimming great. He won the 200 individual medley, the 400 individual medley. Now Moss takes a commanding meet at lead at the first turn. Ooh, Moss exploded off that turn. He sure did. 
it is close to 23.09. He's ahead of Pablo Morales' record pace. And Katamatori looks like he's moved into second place in lane three from Southern Cal. This is lane four. Anthony Moss from Stanford, about a half a body length lead. He's going to hope he can hold on to this lead. He's following much the same strategy as Sean Murphy in the previous event in the two-hour backstroke. And Wharton came out of that last turn and got a good look at where he was, too. That gets him a little excited when he can look up and see that man in front of him. He's well ahead of Pablo Morales' record pace. He's swum in Pablo's shadow for the last three years at Stanford, and he's looking to do something special here tonight. 115.68 is the record split time that you'd be looking for at this point. He's looking real strong at this point. This is an awful tough event. At this point, you'll see some of the swimmers tying up, but Anthony Moss looks very, very strong. Going into the last turn, it's now 25 yards for the record. Moss in four, Wharton in five, the only one with a chance to catch him. It doesn't look like he's got enough room to do it. Doesn't look like Moss has enough to get to the wall, though, and beat Pablo's record. 143.99, and that won't do it. And the fast start looked like it took something out of the it, finish. It, it did. He he he, uh, he felt the, the the pain of that fast start on his last two laps, but he hung on for the win, just like Sean Murphy, his teammate in the earlier event. So Stanford wins back-to-back -back races, and here's the finish. And the, all he's trying to do here is just win it. Hang here, on. Here you can see the tightness in the shoulders. His stroke is slowing down. It's shortening in front. He can't get his arms all the way in front. He's just hoping he can get to the wall before David Wharton of Southern Cal. But he hangs on for the win. And you can see how exhausted Anthony Moss is. He literally has to be helped to the side of the pool. His teammates pull him out. But Stanford is swimming with a lot of pride tonight. They've won two events now. It's a great tradition, and uh, it would have been very easy for them to give up at the end. I mean, knowing that they had won three in a row, favored by many coming back here trying to win their fourth, not doing as well as they had hoped. I mean, they really could have quit, but they haven't done it. They haven't done it, but they sure are showing a lot of pride here tonight. The seniors are, are really producing for them. Anthony Moss, the winner from Stanford. Southern Cal places Wharton and Katamatori, second and third. Back with more. The moment. Here's how they stand after 16 events. 20 and a half points separate Texas and USC with Stanford bringing up third place, the defending champions. 20 and a half points, but in this next event, the 200-yard breaststroke, it looks like Texas is going to be able to widen that lead. It looks like Texas uh, has it wrapped up. Steve Lundquist from SMU with the record, 155 and change. And this is Mark Miller from Wyoming with the fastest qualifying time. Wyoming, you say? Why not a swimming powerhouse? Well, we asked Mark Miller about that very thing. I stayed at the University of Wyoming because I am from Laramie, Wyoming, which is where the university is located, and it's home, and I like the surroundings, and it's a good university, and I attribute my, a lot of my success to my coach right now, Mike Doan, for being here, where I'm at right now. And Miller so far, fifth in the 200 IM, third in the 100 breast in this meet. And this is lane seven, Mark Vandermeer. An interesting story because he is the Division II swimmer, and you just don't see it that often. He had to win his event at the Division II Nationals three weeks ago to qualify for this meet and also make the time standard. And this is one of the first times that a Division II swimmer has ever made it to the big final at a Division I meet. And unless they change the rule within three years, it's not going to ever happen again either. Kirk Stackle is swimming for Texas in lane five. If he finishes third or better in the 200 breaststroke, he will wrap up the team title for the University of Texas. They would have an insurmountable lead. That's true. If, if, even if their, their freestyle relay was disqualified, Southern Cal could not come back to, to beat them if Kirk Stackle gets third or better in this event. Kirk Stackle has been a real contributor to this Texas meet. That's Mark Miller in lane four. He has the lead, but Stackle is right behind him in five, as well as Sergio Lopez from Indiana in lane three. As I was saying, Stackle 
has been a real contributor to this Texas, Texas championship effort. He was sixth in the 200 IM and second in the 100 breaths so far in this meet. Miller in lane four, Stackle in lane five, over in lane eight, Ron Carno, California. Carno's a junior from Cal, and he trains with David Wharton of USC back at Foxcatcher in Pennsylvania in the offseason. Miller of Wyoming in lane four. Another, a little more breathing room. Another interesting point in this race, there are four of eight of the eight finalists are from the Big Ten Conference. There's two swimmers from Michigan, one from Michigan State. Lanes four and five. Mark Miller with the lead. Kurt Stackle of Texas is challenging. Miller wins or has the lead as they make the turn, and Stackle really gaining on him. And Stackle, of course, just needs to finish third or better to wrap it up for Texas. Stackle showing a lot of pride. He wants to win this event and help his Texas team win the team title. Stackle going after Miller. Also coming up is Sergio Lopez of Indiana. He's a freshman from Spain. He'll be swimming for the Spanish Olympic team. And it's Stackle to the wall. Stackle wins it for Texas and wraps up the meet for Texas. What a great moment for Stackle and the University of Texas Longhorns. This, by the way, is the first time in Division I history that both the men's and women's swimming teams have won the t national team title in the same year. Well, what a situation. And here come his Texas teammates, and there you see some of the crowd in attendance here at Indianapolis. What a moment for him, knowing that if he finishes third or better, his team wins. And a lot of guys might coast in that event, but he goes out and wins it. And Phil Boggs has the head cheerleader down there for this Texas team. Congratulations, a great win. Did you know what you needed for the Texas to take the team title? I just, you know, I had to win. And I guess the meet's over right now. I'm pretty happy. <laughs> it is for the team. Did you uh, see your competitor out in front of you for a while? Yeah, I did. I kind of glanced over on pull-outs or whatever, and I knew he was there the whole time. And it was going to be a close race. This is the team title for you with that win. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Congratulations. The Texas Longhorns, with a win in the 200-yard breaststroke, have won the NCAA championship. We'll be back with more in a moment. Now we'll take a look at platform diving. 13 dives in all. We have completed 12. And Jeffrey of Ohio State, who won both the one and three meter competition, has just taken the lead from Scott Doney of SMU. He did an absolutely incredible back three and a half somersault for his last dive. Got all nines from the judges, which is the highest we've seen from anybody in any of the competitions. A great dive. We'll be showing you the entire last round, and Doney and Jeffrey are the sixth and seventh divers out of eight. And look at the view you get to see how high that is up there. How high is it, Phil? Divers joke, it's 10 meters up, but 100 feet down. <laughs> In reality, it's 33 feet up. Just picture yourself standing on the roof of your three-story house and look into your backyard. That's where the water surface is. Michigan, a sophomore. And he was a walk-on, so he's a bit of a very pleasant surprise for the Michigan team. And uh, they've done great in this competition all the way around. Now, obviously, from that height, the impact is something you have to deal with in this. Uh, Actually, platform diving is easier than springboard because you got a big hunk of rock in the sky. The takeoff is much easier to do mechanically. The equalizer is the impact because you hit it about 30 miles an hour. Kurt Bubness of Texas, eighth going into the final round. He's the only one who chose to do an easy dive. That was an easy dive compared to some of the other dives in the competition for his last dive. And that was great. You saw that entry go in with no splash. That's the last thing the judges see and one of the most important points. Now again, to reiterate what we talked about in the one and three meter competition, the judges are not judging the difficulty of the dive. That is prejudged. They are judging the execution of the dive. That's it. They judge the takeoff, how high they jump off the platform, the dive in the air, whether they do exactly what's described, if it's three and a half somersaults, if they do exactly that, and the entry. 
Zeke Crowley of SMU is up next. This is an inward three and one half somersaults. It's going to somersault toward the platform three and a half times in the about two seconds you're in the air. took all 10 meters to make it, but that's okay. Straight in at the bottom. That's why they have it that high, isn't it? <laughs> and watch on the start. He falls back a little bit towards us, but somersaults three and a half times around and just makes it straight up and down before he hits. Now, this is a new event as far as the NCAA is concerned. But it's been an Olympic event since the beginning of the Olympics. And this is very important. The United States has added this to the college uh, schedule of events because it allows our college athletes to train for an Olympic event, which will help the U.S. in its efforts to select an Olympic team. If for nothing else, for development. Absolutely. Jose Rocha from Auburn. He's been on the Mexican Olympic team. So we have some veterans here of international competition. Fourth in the Mexican national. somersaults with three and one half twists. The twists were fine. You saw a little bit of over rotation on the somersault. Judges will take off for that. Watch in the start. He's going to turn and do three and one half twists while his body rotates the one and a half somersaults. Perfect on the twist. A little over rotation. You see a lot of splash kick up. Judges take off for all that. Now, when you were doing this, a lot of these dives really weren't allowed in competition. Now, in 1982, they added just about one more somersault and one more twist to each of the categories and said, you can now do these dives. And most of the divers today do them. Better why, training. Would, why would you not allow someone to do something that would be physically possible to do? Well, what they've chosen to do, same dive that Rocha did, what they've chosen to do is say, here is the book of dives from which you can select your dives to do in competition. You don't, you don't have the ability to invent. Scott Whitten of the University of Miami, a freshman, and that should be good enough to keep him in third place. Just a freshman and another very good dive. Now the competition coming up, and they have another delay with the scores. They've been having a problem with the scoreboard. Well, when the judges put up their scores, they judge on the half, zero to 10, in diving, you hear, you've heard a lot of six and a half, sevens, mm -hmm. eights. Anything better than a seven is good, but they throw out the high and low scores, two of each, take the ones in the middle, multiply those by the degree of difficulty, and that's how they come up with a score. In other words, we need a computer. All right, for people who are not uh, familiar with diving, why do they throw out the two top and two bottoms? Well, they're trying to eliminate prejudice both from a team standpoint in this competition, mm -hmm. where the points they score can influence the team title, and also from an individual standpoint. This is Scott Doney of SMU. He is now second and needs a big dive here. Well, he led most of the competition. He's an excellent platform diver. And an excellent last dive. You saw the position throughout that dive. Everything was tight. His whole body was tight. There was nothing loose, nothing out of position. Went right straight in on the entry. See the legs together, the arms tight against the body, and right straight in on the bottom. Just a fraction short of vertical. So he has a lead of about 43 points on Patrick Jeffy, uh, Jeffrey. As you see, he got 68-8 on that. Now, 43 points for Jeffrey to finish should number be, one. Should be easy. You're talking about a dive with 3.2 degree of difficulty. All he needs is about fours to win the competition. But stranger things have happened. There's your winner. A little over rotation, but still an excellent dive. A big NCAA diving championship for Patrick Jeffrey of Ohio State. This would make a clean sweep. And he's got it. Very fast spin. Nice tight tuck position. It's all curled up in a ball. Just a fraction over rotation on the bottom. Six and a half to seven and a half. The range of his scores, and he picks up 65.6 points and a total of 776.55, and that is going to wrap it up for him and makes Patrick Jeffrey, a senior from Ohio State, uh, 
really enhances his reputation. Well, it's a three-time win in this competition. He has been a member of the U.S. national team and is going to be in the hunt for making the U.S. Olympic team where only two divers make the team. Lewis Myers wrapping up the final round of the platform diving competition. He's a junior at Nebraska. Same final dive as Jeffrey just did. A pretty comparable dive. Yeah. Now we talk about the U.S. Olympic team for this summer. You always allocate one space for Luganus. <laughs> And the two U if you could. Yeah, two if you could is right. But the U.S. has got the number one diving team in the world. So that fight, that fight for the second position is going to be very close. And this will help Jeffrey in his, con in his confidence toward approaching that event. From a standpoint of talent, how would you rate him as a shot of uh, being the second diver? I'd say it's more likely he'll be fourth or fifth position. But on a good day, he has been there before. So it could happen. And he really showed us something, especially in the one and three meter competition, coming from behind to win both of those. And he came from behind the last two dives to win this one. Able to handle the pressure, and that's going to be important for this summer. Jeffrey is the winner of the 10 meter competition here at the NCAA Dive Championships back in a moment. On with the hoot, Nanny. Are you having fun yet? <laughs> There's more fun to come. You can play that again. There's more fun to come when the USA Cartoon Express gets rolling. Weekdays at 6 on USA. Radar is instant weather information. Extended forecasts and latest temperatures are included on radar updates. Reports run 24 hours a day covering Austin and all of Texas. Color Weather Radar on Austin Cablevision Channel 27. Patrick, congratulations. You won not only the 1 meter, the 3 meter, but the 10 meter. What do you think were the keys for you to winning all three diving events? Well, I'll tell you what, Phil. Um, I think taking one event at a time and one dive at a time is what and the consistency by doing that you know taking one dive at a time in each event and taking one event at a time is why I did well I wasn't thinking about winning all three events I was thinking about doing each dive as I did them well and you did them very well congratulations you have to be thinking now about this summer in the Olympics how about your chances there well you know I all I can say is there's a pack of people who are I'm really competitive with, but I'm in the hunt. I, I want to get there. Who's the competition there? Oh, we got Bruce Kimball and Matt Scoggin and Scott Doney and Mike Wontuck, a teammate of mine. And always Greg Luganis. Well, we wish you the best of luck in that competition, and we'll be back with more from Indianapolis after this. that will wrap it up the 400 yard freestyle relay california set the record two years ago 253.02 and in lane four lsu the favorites and there you see the rundown the way they will swim everett will swim the anchor leg lsu with the fastest time in the heats 255.29 and Texas in lane five at 255.73 in the heats. Chris Jacobs will start it off for them. How do you think already having wrapped up the meet, Brian, will affect Texas? A little looser? Go for it? They'll be going for it here. They want to put a, put a lid on it, really burn this place up. Chris Jacobs will be going for Texas. We'll be seeing some interesting starts here in this race. Some of the teams are using sort of a running start from the back of the blocks to get a little bit more speed entering the water. You see Mark Andrews of LSU really churning up the water. Also in Brett Lang and Eric Lane.
98 for Michigan. He won the 100-yard event. He had the fastest leadoff this morning in the heats of the 400 free relay. He's really had an excellent meet for Michigan. He really has. He's a strong sophomore swimmer for Michigan. And he has the lead right now over Chris Jacobs of Texas in lane five. It's Lang in eight, Jacobs in five, LSU with Mark Andrews in four. And Brent Lang hands, hands the lead off to Greg Barner of Michigan in lane eight. But you can really look for Texas, Sean Jordan. In fact, he's already taking the lead away from Greg Barner of Michigan. They're in lane five. And they are ahead of the record split time. Sean Jordan of Texas in five, Adam Schmidt of LSU in four. The next split time to watch for, 127.98. Michigan still in third at being challenged by UCLA, Rodrigo Gonzalez. Texas in lane five with the lead. Keith Anderson now in the water. Dale Carol Pranger. Kranje of LSU. All right, LSU is uh, staying right in there. Kranje making up some of that lead. And he's going for first place himself right now at the turn. But Keith Anderson had a little bit on him on the turn. And the Texas split for Sean Jordan was a 42-7-9, a very fast leg for Sean Jordan in the, in the second split there. Keith Anderson still controlling the race for Texas. They want to they want to win this race in a big way and go out on a real high note. Kranje of LSU in the uh, yellow cap, as you saw, lanes four and five there. Texas, Doug Jertson. And Randy Everett for LSU in lanes four and five. And Doug Jerkson's had a phenomenal meet. Third split there for Keith Anderson was a 43-5 for Texas. They're really going for it here in this race. Blowing away the NCAA record by more than three seconds right now. Jerkson in five with the lead. Everett with the yellow cap from LSU in lane four. About a half a body length behind. And it's all Texas. Going Boy, into the wall. Doug Jurtson just opening up his lead. Texas winning it and winning the meet. NC2A champions for 1988, University of Texas Longhorns. 250-201, an American and NCAA record. And what a way to finish it off for the Texas Longhorns. And a U.S. Open record as well. That's the fastest time ever done for a 400-yard freestyle relay in the United States. What a way to cap the meet for Texas. They really swam with a lot of pride on this final day. Doug Jertson's split was a 42-4-2. Phenomenal split on the end of that relay. Here's the last turn. Jertson going into the turn. Very strong. He comes out and really takes a, a great lead over Randy Everett. Texas won every relay in this meet, the first time it has happened since 1976. Well, this is a real credit to Coach Eddie Reese of the University of Texas. This will be his second national championship. He won before in 1981. And this one must have been very sweet. And we've talked about the dynasties in swimming. We'll develop more on that thought coming up. But Texas has swept the relays and won the 1988 NCAA Swimming and Diving Championships. We'll be back with more from Indianapolis in a moment. The University of Texas with 424 points wins the NCAA Swimming and Diving Championship. Southern Cal finishes second, and Stanford, three-time defending champion, finishes third this year. Now, Texas really came on at the end, broke open a close meet, and ran away with it. Did you have any idea that Texas would be this strong? Well, they were seated real well coming into the meet, but I don't think anybody had an idea that they were going to run away with it like they did here at this championship. Now, it's been since the late 70s that Southern California has won a championship, and I know they must be very disappointed. Uh, a lot of people picked USC to win this one. 
Well, they had a number of big name top performers, and they had some very good performances out of them. But they just got overrun by a, a very uh, deep Texas young enthusiastic uh, team that swam with a lot of heart and just ran away with this championship. A couple of great new records set here by Wharton and Texas in one of the relays. Tremendous performances. Phenomenal performances. I think David Wharton is showing that he's right on schedule to represent the United States this summer in the Olympics. And the Texas team, what can you say? A, a group of guys swimming with a lot of heart. They came in tonight. They blew away the American record in the 400 freestyle relay. And that's, a, that's the way to go out and win a championship. Just go out and take it. And uh, congratulations to the University of Texas. They just did a phenomenal job. Well, this will light up the Texas Tower, the 19th national championship that the Longhorns have enjoyed. And we hope you've enjoyed watching the 1988 Men's Swimming and Diving Championships as much as we've enjoyed bringing them to you. For all of us at ESPN, thanks for watching and good night, everybody. Division One Men's Swimming and Diving Championships have been brought to you by Sue B. Honey, purity you can taste.